Good evening from Rocky Mountain PBS. I'm Cynthia Hessen. This is Colorado State of Mind. Tonight, a look at the county secession movement underway now in Colorado, a movement that its supporters likened to a prairie fire, spreading as it has from Weld County to nine other northeastern counties and one in the northwest, Moffat. The voters in all 11 of these counties will decide in November whether to approve a resolution to explore forming the 51st state in the union, or in the case of Moffat, perhaps become part of Wyoming. Not unlike the South seceding from the North in the 1860s, this secession is a decided push away from the values of Colorado's Front Range Urban Corridor, where the bulk of the population lives. And, say the advocates of the movement, the people need to take more control locally of their rural, agribusiness and energy towns. The movement stems from a number of concerns, as you're about to hear, but none more solid than the differences over guns. Earlier this year, when the state legislature was poised to pass two new gun laws, Democratic State Senator Lois Tochtrop was quoted in the National Review as warning her fellow legislators, quote, I feel like all those gun bills have done is to quote the last words of the movie Tora 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 to awaken a sleeping giant. Senator Tochtrop may not have fully realized the determination of the giant. At iNews at Rocky Mountain PBS, we wondered how these two new states would stack up in terms of assets and liabilities. Here's our report from the Northeastern Territory, and then we'll talk further with our two guests. The vast expanses of Colorado's Northeast counties are where most of the state's agricultural products are produced. Weld County, in fact, ranks fifth in the nation for farm and ranch output. The 336,000 people who live in the 11 counties, which are contemplating secession, would make the new state the least populous in the country, behind Wyoming's 564,000 residents. It's an area of Colorado where people were outraged earlier in the year when the Democrat-controlled state legislature passed new gun laws, new oil and gas rules, and a new mandate on generation of rural electric power. We're, uh, we're about asking the question, what's the proper role of government? Um, what should the role of government be? And so we're um, advocating um, a thinner state government, more local control. We think more local government is most accountable to its people. And we've seen that um, in the recent recall elections, for example. Local People want local government regardless of uh, your political beliefs or background across the political spectrum. So we're trying to advocate for um, returning control of the people through uh, having a, a larger role in local government. This started, and uh, you know, it started as uh, a citizen request uh, in this very hearing room. This is the birth of the idea of the 51st state. You're sitting in the very hearing room in which citizens came to the board of Well County Commissioners and said, you know, we are frustrated. Uh, we feel politically disenfranchised. We see Colorado changing from the state we grew up in, we live in. And uh, have you entertained thoughts of, of this idea? And from that was the genesis of where we are today. Conway and Hare point proudly to the county road repairs they've done in Weld since the September flooding in this part of the state all accomplished with county revenue, no help from state or federal funds. And where does all the money come from? A lion's share is tax collection from the energy industry. The new state, comprised of 10 or 11 counties, would have more than half of all Colorado oil and gas wells. Not coincidentally, it's the move toward a statewide ban on fracking, already taking place in Boulder, Longmont, and other Front Range areas, that could further galvanize the people here in Weld County, where so many depend on the fossil fuel economy. A lot of people are shocked when I ask them, what are the top three economic drivers in the state of Colorado? They are in order. Energy, number one. Agriculture, number two. This being the largest agricultural area in the state by far. And three, tourism. Like the governor recently said, that the urban areas subsidize the rural areas. How is that possible when the top three economic drivers are all entities outside of the metro area? The, the rural areas of the state of Colorado clearly drive the Colorado economy. They're creating many high-paying jobs. And our concern is, is we have an urban-centric legislature that is not taking that into account. And that's what's driving this movement. If the secession idea gained momentum and were ever to be approved by Congress, the two new states would look like this. Moffat County in the northwest, plus Weld, Logan, Sedgwick, Phillips, Yuma, Washington, Kit Carson, Cheyenne, Elbert, and Lincoln, 
are counties with lower rates of high school and college degrees than the state as a whole. In racial makeup, the new state would have a higher percentage of Latino residents than Colorado proper, and a higher rate of poverty, a lower crime rate, and a lower percentage of residents under age 18. Voter registration would be dominated by Republicans, the fifth highest ratio of Republicans to Democrats in the U.S. Colorado proper could lose one four-year university, three community colleges, three state prisons, and three state parks. According to an iNews analysis, the state of Colorado currently spends more money in the 11 counties, 60 to 120 million dollars more each year than it receives in revenue from the counties. That analysis is disputed by 51st state advocates. The rural versus urban divide, says Jeffrey Hare and Sean Conway, is about more than money. It's a feeling that their political representation at the state capitol has crumbled. I, I don't want to leave Colorado. Unfortunately. In many respects, Colorado has left us, and they've left us no choice. And we just feel we're fighting for the, our very survival. Thank you to iNews Joe Mahoney, Bert Hubbard, and Jim Trotter for their work on this report. Also to Ryan Conley for graphics. Joining me now to talk further about the secession movement is Dr. Derek Everett, adjunct professor of history at Metropolitan State University, Denver, and also Nathan Heffel, reporter for KUNC Public Radio in Northern Colorado. Welcome to you both. And Nathan, I know you've been reporting on this for some weeks, and you've been talking to a lot of different people. Yeah, I've talked to、uh, quite a few residents just off the cuff, asking them about the movement、um, in my other reporting, and it's. It's interesting to note they're, they're less interested in the ideological points of the 51st movement, but more the practical things,、hmm. uh, like uh, how would our streets be maintained? Would there be a state police?、Uh, water rights concern, oil and gas concerns, things that really would affect them directly, as opposed to the ideological points、uh, like gun rights and things like that, which are more what the advocates are talking about. Sean、Correct. Conway and, and Jeffrey Hare.、Um, they do, of course, as we saw in the piece, Derek,、um, admit that there's there'd be a long road to go here. Because, as I understand it, Puerto Rico has been waiting for 15 years for statehood. Is、well, that right? Depending on how you count it, Puerto Rico has been debating its status in the United States for the 115 years since it was conquered from Spain, and、uh, there there is a long road ahead. Uh, before this 51st state could be created, it would have to get the approval of the state legislature. It would have to get the approval of the voters of the state of Colorado because the boundaries of the state are within the Constitution, so that would have to be amended. And according to the U.S. Constitution, once you've gotten the approval of the state legislature of the public in that state, if need be, then it is up to the federal government. And so it would be a question of whether the House, the Senate, and the White House. Want this state as well? Considering we're in the middle of a government shutdown, there's a lot of other issues that are are being debated right now. I'm not sure how high on the list the creation of a new state would be. Well, of course, it, it's not even on the ballot till November,、exactly. so they they can take a few months and <laughs> and think of it next year maybe. Right.、Um, this is the first time this has happened、um, since West Virginia pulled away from Virginia. West Virginia was the last state to break away in 1863, and even the legality of that、uh, after the Civil War was in question because West Virginia didn't really get the approval of Virginia to leave because、oh. Virginia wasn't playing with the federal government at that time. So there there were some court cases, and the U.S. Supreme Court ultimately said yes, West Virginia is legal. It's okay for them to to be a state. But as far as peace. Time it hasn't happened since Maine broke away from Massachusetts in 1820 as part of the Missouri Compromise. And interestingly, there's been a, a lot of talk about the Missouri Compromise from advocates of the secession movement because you know Maine comes in as a free state, Missouri joins as a slave state, and it's of course nothing to do with slavery anymore. Now it's all about partisanship. So the talk is maybe this North Colorado or New Colorado or Liberty or whatever name、uh, they're going to select can come in. As a predominantly Republican state, balanced with Puerto Rico as a predominantly Democrat state,、um, That's the, the the question of how Puerto Rico feels about being. You know their 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 fate being connected to some place that has only been talked about for a few months. When again, Puerto Rico has been discussing its status for 115 years. That's from from what I've gleaned of the little interest it's gotten in Puerto Rico. It's not been a very positive reaction. The notion that their fate and this、uh, North Colorado movement would be connected in any way. 
Nathan, the Weld County commissioners were the ones who actually started this, but just in June, really, and it's right. it's spread to these other counties. Tell us more about that. Well, it's it's interesting to know that this this appears to be a large a feeling of a large disconnect between the urban parts of the state and the more rural parts, Weld County, and the commissioners understand that this is a long road to go, but they're committed to it, and they don't believe it's a waste of time or a waste of money to put this on the ballot, and they're fighting to get other counties, rural counties into the movement. Uh, they're even penning uh, editorials, which are going out every couple weeks, to really discuss some of the more key points uh, that people have concerns about the 51st state movement, be it water rights or agriculture issues and things like that. Interesting. Well, when we were talking to Sean Conway uh, earlier in the week, he talked about this series of meetings that they had um, around the county. Let's hear what he had to say about that. This was not a knee-jerk reaction. I think a lot of people thought that our frustration over the last session in, in, at the General Assembly, uh, that we just kind of lashed out. We were petulant. Uh, we were knee-jerk. That's not what happened here. We spent um, from early June to late August having a series of community meetings um, here and throughout Well County um, to judge uh, and, and to take the pulse of where our citizenry was. And overwhelmingly, whether some people agreed or disagreed with the idea of a 51st state, the one thing they wanted to do was vote on it. And so they will vote on it in November in Weld County and, and 10 other counties. Sean Conway seemed to think that maybe by the time November rolls around, there'd be more counties. What do you know about that? Well, there always are other counties that are looking at this. Again, it's too early to tell if they'll be on board or not, but it definitely is the main goal, it seems to me, of the Weld County Commissioners to get as many of these rural counties on board as soon as possible going towards November, which would build that uh, momentum that they so continue to talk about. And as Nathan mentioned, there uh, in the county commissioner meetings that were held in Weld County, the general sense of the public wasn't necessarily you know, by golly, we need to secede, we've got to break away. It was this sense of frustration that urban counties and rural counties didn't really understand one another and that the contributions of rural counties weren't being appreciated, weren't being recognized by the legislature, which is by population dominated by the urban corridor mm -hmm. along the front range. So this, this is very much sort of an urban-rural divide as much as it is a partisan divide. Uh, anything else, that, that tension that has existed not only in Colorado, but around the country for, well, since there's been a country. I guess that that's right. There's also sort of a, a disagreement here about whether the Weld County, for instance, contributes more than it takes from the state. Um, our analysis showed that if you leave aside state lands, it's very complicated, but that actually a state is spending more money than it is receiving from Weld County. I guess Sean Conway doesn't uh, agree with that, but is that something the residents seem to feel that there's a, an imbalance that way? Well, it's interesting. Uh, again, as I was uh, doing my reporting on this, the residents are concerned about things about, let's say, water rights. And uh, Sean Conway has penned a editorial talking about how in the event the 51st state becomes a, an actual reality, it wouldn't be that hard to maybe go to other states and negotiate these new compacts. And it seems interesting because water is such a rarity <laughs> these days that that would be an easy thing to do, would be to go as a new state to negotiate with other states for You're water saying rights. He's thinking it would be an easy thing to do? Yeah, he said essentially that uh, it, it's something that could be possibly done, and it's something that in theory could possibly happen as a new state. Uh, also talking about the Big Thompson Water Project, where uh, that would continue to be in play regardless if there's a new state or not. And so concerns that the public may have about water rights may not be as uh, uh, serious a as they may think. What about other p political figures in Weld County, uh, the mayor of Greeley, uh, other people who would certainly be interested in where this is going? Um, is there anyone standing up to say this is not going to happen? I don't want this to happen. Well, there, there definitely are, are concerns uh, in terms of the what this does for the image of northern Colorado, and particularly cities like Greeley and, and counties like Weld County. Um, I, I don't have a lot of reporting background about the uh, direct impact that would have on the city of Greeley, but uh, again, the city is undergoing a brand new image campaign uh, called Greeley Unexpected, really drumming up what Greeley is, and, and some people I've spoken to maybe have a concern that that could be negatively impacted by the press that was received nationwide by the uh, 51st state movement. And that was actually 
how I got involved in participating in some of these meetings is that I was following the Facebook page that the 51st State Initiative that, that Jeffrey Hare uh, organizes, and I saw a posting before the last meeting, which took place in Alt on July 31st, talking about some of the interviews that they had been lined up, uh, including one with the Rachel Maddow program. And I'm assuming that Rachel Maddow is as popular in Weld County as Glenn Beck is on the Pearl Street Mall. And I, I was worried when I saw that this was the sort of attention that, that it was getting because over and over in these meetings you heard people say, we understand that this is almost certainly not going to happen. We're not going mm. to secede, but we're finding our voice. And we feel like our needs, that our interests, somebody's actually paying attention to us. Somebody's listening to us. And we feel like we haven't had that for so long. And from what I've studied of other secession movements in other states across the country, West Kansas in 1992, Jefferson between California and Oregon bubbles up every once in a while. The danger is that once the, the outside media starts to grab hold of it, the attention is on the difficulty, the almost impossibility of it happening, and the real concerns, the frustrations that people had that led to the talk in the first place, those get shoved aside. Hmm. And, and that's the most painful thought to me because people feel like they're, they're being part of the process again, that they're being heard. And it worries me that once the focus is all on secession and how difficult or impossible that might be to accomplish, those issues of oil and gas development or water rights or gun rights or whatever that are really what they care about, that's going to fade away. And I think that that's an interesting point, that that's what the Weld County Commissioners are really trying to do with these editorials that they're penning, yeah. is to get their message kind of in a solid, straight line to really say, this is what we believe, and it's more than just a secession movement. There is more involved here, and here are exactly what our, our issues and concerns are. And there is a... a bit of a divide between the Weld County Commissioners who've really taken the lead in this and say the 51st State Initiative, the, the group that's sort of in, in public organizing the face of it, because the, the initiative on its Facebook page bounces back and forth between secession to create a new state, secession to join Wyoming or somebody else. There's even been the proposal that all of the, what, 62 other counties should get together and vote Denver and Boulder out of Colorado. And I'm not exactly sure how the logistics of, of most of this would work, but I think just overall the fact that it, it's this frenetic bouncing around from point to point illustrates the overwhelming sense of frustration that is at the root of this entire movement. And there are other states that apparently people, people like Jeffrey Hare have been talking to. So they're sort of like-minded in these other places? There, there is definitely an interest, sort of a, a sense of common cause between, say, the North Colorado movement and people in the western part of Maryland and in the area between California and Oregon all of which have talked about secession for, for decades. Certainly the idea of seceding from a state is nothing particularly new, motivated by similar sort of frustrations, feeling that you're being ignored by wherever the economic or political center might be. And so there, there is this sense of camaraderie that if West Maryland can do it, if Jefferson can do it, the proposed state between California and Oregon, then there's a chance for us. Now granted, bear in mind that, for example, the Jefferson movement of Northern California and Southern Oregon has been talked about at least since 1941 and has not succeeded as far as I can tell up to this point. But the frustration remains, this sense of disconnect remains. It seems as though Jeffrey Hare, especially from the 51st State Initiative, is four square behind his Weld County Commissioners. He feels as though that local government is listening to him. And as you say, it, certainly that's where government seems to work the best anyway, is, is locally, where you can talk to the people who are governing. Um, but then he, of course, he and Sean Conway pointed out that during these informational meetings, none of the state legislators in these places came to the meetings. Did people talk about that? There was a, uh, an editor of a newspaper that's based out of Keensburg who attended all of the meetings and at each one spoke up about how there were local mayors, members of city councils or county commissioners from various parts of the area, but that no state legislators had appeared and how angry that made him and many others feel that 
these are your constituents speaking out about something, whether you agree with secession or not. This is a large group of people who feel strongly about an issue. The, the notion that you have dozens of people showing up for a county commissioner meeting, that doesn't happen very often. And the fact that even legislators from that part of the state didn't seem to be paying attention has sort of reinforced the anger that you know we maybe elect people from Weld County to go to Denver, but then Denver takes over and they forget about what the frustrations are here at home. We had a governor with a rural background in Roy Romer um, a few years ago, and then of course Sean Conway worked as chief of staff to Senator Wayne Allard, who had the veterinarian rural background. Um, so they seem sort of nostalgic about that, Nathan, about having leaders who come from this background and understand their concerns. And I think that's an interesting point, that there is definitely this feeling that something has been lost in, in current government today, in, in, at least in the state of Colorado, where there is a focus on the urban corridor and, and a lack of, of maybe discussions or uh, uh, kind of a, a view towards the rural parts of the state. And I think that really is, like you've been saying, the, the, the cusp of what's been going on with this movement, is that rural divide between what you see in, let's say, Denver and, and Boulder and what you do see in, in Weld County uh, and, and people feeling that they're not a part of the state they remember when they were younger. And one of the interesting proposals that has come about through this discussion, sort of recognizing the difficulty of secession, is an idea that was put forward by the Phillips County Commissioners out in Holyoke of uh, reworking probably the Senate so that the Senate was based off of region rather than population. Because right now both the State House oh, and State yes. Senate are based on population figures, so the Denver area is going to dominate. But if the State Senate was made up to look more like the U.S. Senate, where you have equal representation from each state across the, the country, that maybe that would help rural communities have a greater voice. Now, there are all sorts of uh, legal hurdles to that idea. There have been a number of Supreme Court cases uh, that, that would question the legality of that. But it's certainly an idea, and it's, it's one that has developed its own sort of popular backing as maybe a more practical approach than secession. Instead of leaving, let's try to fix it from within. So that every county has its own state senator. Sure. Every, that either, either every county has its own senator or probably every two counties or so. There are 35 members of the state senate and 64 counties, and part of it is logistics. There wouldn't, there's not room in the senate chamber in the capitol for 64 senators. But uh, certainly an idea that's, that's gaining some traction. Nathan, you say that the uh, Weld County Commissioners have been trying to sell it a little bit in these editorials. What do they say about um, some of these demographic figures where they would end up, or the new state would have more people um, by a lion's share? Of, it would be Republican as opposed to Democrat. Has anyone discussed the the uh, political makeup of the new state. There have been two, at least as of this week, uh, two editorials. One was the first kind of kickoff talking about the difference between agriculture and rural, and the next one was about water rights. And so I'm assuming there will be more editorials in the future that would be ah, discussing right. that. But as of now, it's really the, the crux of the uh, people maybe in, in more uh, uh, metro areas of, of Colorado don't know where their food comes from. Well, it comes from here in Weld County and, and the concern that some people have about water rights. Well, if we become a 51st state, will our water go away once we place our borders as a new state? And that's something that they're saying, no, there, there, there are ways that we will be able to handle water coming into our new state if that happens. That is certainly the, the biggest issue, I would think, or one of the biggest. There are many here. <laughs> well, and as, as Nathan's pointed out, with the Weld County Commissioners sort of leading the way in this discussion, they're starting to perkle up some, some accusations that maybe is, is this a way for people to win a statewide office that might not win it in Colorado, but could win it in North Colorado, that, you know, is this an effort to pad the offices for governor or U.S. senator or something, which again is seen in almost every secession movement. When, when you s hear this talk, maybe it's that, uh, that it's being fueled by those who feel this is a, a step forward for them 
politically. So it's a very slippery slope for Weld County commissioners or any politicians to be pushing this too hard because then it looks not only as if they're trying to speak out for their constituents, but perhaps feathering their own nests. Well, and I think it's really interesting. I mean, this still has to come to a vote of the people sure. in November in that sense. And it's really going to be interesting, at least from my reporting, uh, what I'm going to be waiting for is what the people have to say. We hear this build up. Yes, there is this this wave coming, but it, it won't be decided until November. And if something doesn't happen, then where are these Weld County commissioners and other people who've decided to, to move forward with this initiative? Or if some counties vote yes and some counties vote no, you know, how, how does this shake out? Um, I, I have a book coming out on state boundaries in the West, so it's been very convenient that this whole debate is taking place just as, as I'm, I'm building up to this conclusion. So it's, it's fascinating to watch. It definitely is. And so, so that's the talk this week in, uh, in northern Colorado. And before we end this evening, we want to talk about the other talk talk of the week. That's the federal government shutdown. It so shows no sign of ending, at least as of Thursday. And our reporter Steve Mort was on the Auraria campus this week to find out what people are saying. Well, I'm, a, I'm concerned about my unemployment check. I'm not sure if that's going to affect that. I know they stated that it wasn't going to affect the disability or the Medicaid, Medicare and uh, Social Security. But um, I'm a little concerned about my unemployment check when I go to file this coming Sunday. I'm disappointed because we can't come to an agreement and we got you know, our elected officials are the ones that are getting paid through this. The other federal um, employees, they have nothing. I think it's ridiculous from a personal perspective, but I also understand that it came down to a stalemate. Neither one of the parties want to basically step up and do the right thing. I'm really frustrated, I think, at this point because I think the politicians really need to stop playing the games and move on because it's affecting everybody in general and it you know I, I really believe that it's it's ridiculous quite frankly I know people that um, are in the military I know people that uh, are on disability um, I know people that are retired collecting Social Security um, it's just not a good thing for this country Colorado Voices coming from the Auraria campus in Denver. And that's all for Colorado State of Mind this week. You may see the program again at video.rmpbs.org. Thank you now to Derek Everett and Nathan Heffel and the iNews staff for our story tonight on the 51st State. Next week, as flooded areas of Colorado continue their recovery effort, iNews looks at what last month's devastation may portend for the future. Are we in for more intense fires and flooding? Join us for that next week, and thank you for tuning in this weekend. I'm Cynthia Hesse. Good night.